Amen. So in 1 Samuel chapter 29, uh, we see in this chapter that David has developed a reputation among the Philistines, and that's you know perfectly uh, reasonable. That's to be expected. I mean, you've got to remember David's the guy when, as a young lad, went out and slew their greatest champion, Goliath, right? So no doubt they know about David. He has developed a reputation with them, not only for that, but also, I believe, as we'll see here in a minute, for the way David has handled himself, uh, even in the, in the recent times, of course, you know, referring back to when David was around. But uh, he's developed a reputation among the Philistines and more specifically in uh, King Achish. He's got a reputation among him. And that's interesting. We'll look at that here in a minute. And also among, among the princes or the lords of the Philistines. They calls it, you know, it uses that interchangeably if you notice there. You know, he calls them princes and then he calls them lords. So <laughs> what I want to preach to you about tonight is a reputation of faithfulness. A reputation of faithfulness. Because I believe that's what we see here with Dave, that he is a man who has developed a reputation for being faithful. He has a reputation uh, among the Philistines, but even, you know, it, when you read that, you could see that King Achish, King Achish knows that he's a faithful man, and then you could also see that the Philistines know that he's a faithful man, and that, and they're, and there's, you know, but that leads them to different conclusions, right, if we were, if we were paying attention there, and we'll get into that here in a minute. But let's look, first of all, at David's reputation with King Achish. So what's interesting about this, keep something in 1 Samuel chapter 29, but go back to 1 Samuel chapter 21, is that, you know, David is, is kind of being praised here by King Achish. He's big, you could tell King Achish is really glad to have him on his side. He says, you know, you're an angel of God to me. You know, you've, been, you've done nothing but good by me. He's glad to have him there. Remember in the previous uh, chapter, you know, he had given him a whole town, Ziklag, when, G, when uh, David came to dwell with him, he gave him a town to go dwell there. And so you could see that Achish, you know, he's, he's pro-David. He's for David. He likes having David on his side. And it's kind of interesting because the current reputation that we see in, in, in chapter 29 with King Achish, that reputation that he has, does not really line up with King Achish's first impression of David. And let's go back to where King Achish first meets David in, in 1 Samuel chapter 21. Okay, in verse 10 it says, And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul. So this is when he first leaves the land or leaves Saul and goes to journey in the wilderness, right? And all the other men come to him and went to Achish of the king of Gath. And the servants of the Achish said unto him, is not this David the king of the land? So you hear that a lot, right? You hear that here. We've read that twice in our chapter tonight. Is not this David, you know, and, and he's got this reputation. Hey, they people know who David is, okay? Is not this David the king of the land? Did I not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands, which was a song that they sang after he defeated Goliath and, the Phil you know, and then went on to defeat the Philistines when they came back. That was the song that the Israelites sung about David. They're saying, you know, hath not David slain his ten thousands and Saul his thousands? And we remember that Saul boohooed about that, right? That was, you know, made him, that made him feel bad. But notice that the Philistines heard the song, so this must have been, you know, a real catchy tune. You know, this got around the land. They had, they had heard this song, and they probably might have even known it, right? Verse 12, And David laid up these words in his heart, and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So he's like, whoa, they know about me here too. They know what, maybe they'll remember that I'm the guy that took off the head of Goliath. You know, he gets a little afraid. He does not know how Achish is going to respond. So what does David do, right? Look at verse 13, And he changed his behavior before them, and feigned himself mad in their hands. You know, feigned, faked. You know, he's faking this. He feigned himself mad in their hands. And they must have really struck them as odd when you kind of get the chronology here. You know, David shows up and he's perfectly fine. Then he realizes they know who he is and he starts faking being mad, right? And it says there, and he changed his behavior before their face and, and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the door. And it's not talking about the game. And scrabbled on the doors of the gate. So he kind of, I just imagine like, eh, you know, doing like some kind of, like what is scrabbling? You know, like is it... You know, you think about scribble, just like moving your hands like that, just scribbling. So maybe he's just kind of like, you know, I'm not going to act it out completely, folks. I know you really want to see it, all right? And as tempted as I am to do it, but you can just see him kind of like, you know, scrabbling at the door, right? And what else does he do? And let spittle fall down upon his beard. You know, he let it happen. You know, sometimes we were talking about the church fan tonight when the preacher gets going, the spittle starts flowing, right? But uh, he's, you know, that we, that's by accident. You know, that's just the nature of, of preaching. You know, just get, you know, you got something good when the, the preacher starts to foam with the mouth, literally, right? But he's faking it here. He's letting it happen. He's making the foam. You know, he's popping the Alka-Seltzer and turning around, uh, scrabbling at the door. It's quite the image to see David doing this, right? 
But this is the first impression that King Ankish has of him. This is when David, you know, first impressions, they say, are everything. You only get one shot at it, right? So he shows up, and he starts acting like a crazy guy. You know, he's scrabbling, foaming at the mouth. And then in verse 14, it says, Then said Achish unto his servant, Lo, you see this man, is, the, this man is, uh, the man is mad. Wherefore then you have brought him to me? Have I need of a madman, of madmen, that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this com fellow come into my house? He's like, I have, they're like, yeah, but he, he wasn't like that a second ago. And they're like all perplexed, right? And of course we know that David goes away. So you have to kind of think about the fact that that was how David started out with King, a King Achish. And maybe even King Achish had heard, they would have, hey, they're like, hey, David's here. He would have gone, oh, David, you know? Who knows what his initial reaction would have been. But his reputation of David, the reputation of David had obviously preceded him into the land of Philistines, even at this point where I believe King, King Achish knew who he was. I mean, he's the king of Gath, which was, Goliath was the champion, you know, of Gath. He was of Gath as well. So he probably knew who David was, all right? So he, I don't know, maybe he was going to be willing to receive him at that time even. You know, he did later. I don't see why he wouldn't. Sometimes, you know, as the saying goes, that the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? So if, oh, you're turning on, you're coming to me for refuge, and you know you're a mighty warrior, you know, he probably would have rec received him, but David gets nervous, scrabbles at the door, foams at the mouth, and what does he do? He kind of ruins his reputation, you know, and he's trying to save his skin, and it's not like he was getting into sin or doing something bad like that, you know, he did that later, and he kind of brought a, a mark on his reputation. We understand that. But he's kind of purposefully ruining his reputation, right? That's where he started out with King Achish. And then in chapter 29, we get there, you know, he, he kind of restores that reputation. He later restores uh, having a good reputation. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 27, 1 Samuel chapter 27, this is when David first comes there. It says in verse 2, And David arose and passed over with 600 men that were with him unto Achish. So he's going back, you know. Let me go back now and, and, and see what Achish is up to. And the son of Machach, the king of Gath. And David dwelt with Achish at Gath. And, uh, you know, obviously this time it's a different story. And, and he's received, verse 5, And David said to Achish, I have, I have now found grace in thy sight. Let me, uh, uh, let me see, L let them give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there, for why should thy servant dwell in the royal city with thee? Then Achish gave him Ziklag that day, wherefore Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. So something has taken place between chapter 21 and chapter 27 to where now David's perfectly comfortable going there and, and Achish is glad to receive him. He doesn't say, what are you doing here, madman? I remember he's not bringing that up. Weren't you the guy that was scrabbling at the door and foaming at the mouth? You know, the, something has taken place here to where David has restored his reputation with King Achish. And how did he do that? And that's what I want to talk to you about. How did David restore his reputation? Well, he restored it through faithfulness, through being a faithful individual, you know. Uh, so between their first meeting and second meeting with Achish, David, you know, what has he done? What, is, what has he done to show himself a faithful man? To show that he is a faithful individual, that he is somebody who is loyal, well, think about the fact that he spared Saul's life twice when he was given into his hand, when he could have killed him. And in no doubt, you know, no doubt that was also spread abroad. You know, <clears throat> that also was it's something that would have been talked about. You know, remember when, because the, the second, especially the, for sure the second time, where David's up on the precipice, he's a great way off and he's crying out. All the other 3,000 men are there, the 3,000 chosen men of war are with him, and he's holding up his spear and his bolster, or was this a spirit? Yeah. And he says, hey, you know, and he, and he calls out and says, you know, you didn't spare your master's life. And, he, and he's saying, yeah, I could have taken you. Uh, everybody's hearing it, right? The point being is that that would have gotten around most likely. People would have talked about that kind of thing. And now maybe that's even gotten back into the ears of King Ziklag, or not King Ziklag, King Achish, who is, you know, finding out, oh, David is a faithful man, even when he could have killed Saul. Because remember, in 29, he says, is not this David the servant of Saul? Not Saul's enemy. You know, not the one who's going to replace Saul, but he still has that, that reputation of being his servant. Someone who's faithful, somebody who's loyal. So the application is this, is that, you know, a lot of, and, you know, a lot of times if we come in, people who come into Christian life later, you know, they've made mistakes. They, or even Christians who get backslid and get out of sorts with the Lord, they make mistakes and they get a bad reputation or they have a bad past. And I'm here to, and if people can carry around that weight and they can, they can just feel like God's not going to use me, God has no use for me, 
you know, they just feel like they're, they're not as good, like, you know, they're just, they're useless, basically. But here's the thing, if we have a bad reputation, you know, that's, that's not a good thing, we should avoid that. But if that's already happened, look, that we should never give up. We shouldn't just say, you just, you just say, well, what's the point of trying to live a Christian life? Because reputations can be restored. Now, of course, David here, he's restoring his reputation, and it's not because he got into sin. You know, he was trying to just kind of play it smart, right? But we even see, we just see that as an example of somebody who has restored his reputation from going considered a madman, a fool, to going to one who has received and called, oh, you're an angel to me. I'll, let me give you a whole city. Come to war with me, right? How did he do that? He did that by being faithful. Now, what we have to understand is that, and if you would, go over to Proverbs chapter 22. We're going to flip around a little bit here for a minute. Go to Proverbs chapter 22. Is that you can restore a bad reputation. But it's not like, you know, it's just instantaneous. It's not like, you know, you're living out in the world, you're in sin, maybe you're Christian, you're backslidden, or maybe you're newly saved. Right? This is something a lot of people experience with their family and so forth. You know, you grow up, you're living like the world, you know, you're partying with them, you're hanging out with them, you're doing what they do. Then one day you get saved, you want to start living for the Lord, and all of a sudden you've changed. And everybody notices. And they say, oh, this is just a phase for you. You know, you'll get off that bandwagon, you'll be back. Or they start to mock you and things like that. And, and, and here's the thing, it's because your reputation doesn't, you know, they have an idea what a Christian is mm. supposed to be, and you haven't been that, mm. right? That doesn't mean that, you know, it's over for you, that God can't use you. It just means that you have to either restore that reputation or gain it to begin with, right? Now, how do you do that? How do you get that reputation of faithfulness? Well, the first thing you have to understand, it's something that's done over time. It's not instantaneous. Right. You're not just going to go to your family, you know, be hanging out, partying, drinking, all that, get saved. And I know you don't have to clean up your life to get saved, but let's say you get saved, you know, and then you start living for the Lord and go back there and expect them to just be like, oh, you've such, got such a great reputation. That takes time to develop a reputation of faithfulness. So we can restore a bad reputation by being faithful over time. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, a good, a good name is, to better, is better than precious ointment. And before I get into the, you know, this, this point I'm making right now, let me just say, you should care about your reputation. You should care about what other people think about you as a Christian. Now, obviously, we don't care what you know, a bunch of God-haters think about us. We don't, you know, if we're taking a righteous stand, if we're preaching the word of God and people hate on that, fine. You know, we're not going to bend or, and, and try to please people and compromise the word of God to, to appease them and what they think of us. Okay? But we should care about our testimony to the unsaved, to the world. We should care about our testimony to our lost friends and family, to the people in our community, our co-workers, so on and so forth. They should, they should go, oh, you're a Christian? That makes sense because I see how you live your life. I see how you raise your family, so on and so forth. They shouldn't, you shouldn't come out one day, oh, I'm a Christian. Really? I never would have guessed based upon your reputation, how you conduct yourself, your behavior. I never would have even guessed that you're a Christian. What a shame that would be if that was our testimony. And again, if we've done that in the past, it's not that, it, it, well, it's all over for us. Now, you might, you know, certain bri bri uh, bri uh, bridges you burn, you know, that's it. You know, it may, it may be over time you can restore them, but a lot of times you can't. Well, look, we can move on in life. We can restore a reputation of being a faithful person or we gain it in the first place. And we should care. You know, it says a better name, uh, a good name is better than precious ointment. A good name, what's a good name? It's, you know, having a good reputation. You know, you say somebody's name, they say, oh, he's a good man. You know, she's a good woman. Those are good people, right? That is a name, a good name. That is a reputation that they've earned, right? And it's interesting. It says it's better than precious ointment. So it compares it to like an ointment or a perfume, you know, or a cologne, something that, is, that smells, right? And what I believe, why he's drawing that parallel, you know, bringing in this idea of an ointment is because, you know, you can't cover up a bad reputation, you know, you, you, you can't, it's like, it's going to go before you. It precedes you, right? You know, some, sometimes when people really lay on the cologne or the perfume thick, right, you could smell them coming around the corner. You smell them before you see them. And the, ear, the eyes tear up, you know, and you're like, <coughs> you know, and then, oh, they're here. You know, it, it, it goes before them, right? And if you have an, uh, an odor on, an ointment, you know, you can't just turn that off and on. You know, once you put that on, it's yours. You're going to wear it. 
And, and he's kind of drawing that parallel with a good name because in, in some ways it's like an ointment. It goes before you. You know, and, you, and when you show up, people are instantly thinking this about you or thinking that about you. You already have a reputation. You ever hear the phrase, his, re he, his reputation stinks? You know, I've heard that. You know, it's, it's kind of that kind of a parallel. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. You know, if, if it came down to, hey, I have to have honesty and integrity, and maybe I have to not get the raise, not get the promotion, not get that job, you know, whatever it is, if it comes down to money or having a good name, take the good name. Have the reputation. That's better. And it goes on, it says, uh, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. You know, and verse 2 is not disconnected. It says, the rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is maker of them all. Why should you care about your reputation? Because you know what, you, could, you, know, you can just toss your reputation aside and just become a person who's just going to get rich and get wealth at all costs, step on heads, cheat, lie, steal. You don't think people out there that do that? Absolutely. Or they don't live for God. They're not known as a Christian. They're not known as one who lives godly. They're just all about money, 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 money. Riches, gold, silver. They care more about that than their own reputation. But why should you care more about your reputation? Because the Lord is maker of them all. The Lord is maker of them all. Of them all and one day, it says there, the rich and the poor meet together. Meaning this, that one day, all you're going to have is your reputation before God. You know, if anyone, you know, the, the, the person we should care about the most of having a good reputation with is the Lord. And we should work and live our lives in a way that, you know, no matter what, when we get to heaven, we have a good reputation because one day that's all we're going to have. All the riches and the gold and the silver are going to go away. But the guy who was faithful, who loved the Lord, who didn't lie, didn't cheat, didn't steal, was honest, had integrity, maybe suffered loss, maybe had, had difficulties, had a harder life, you know, didn't get to have all the toys and everything else that the other people do, so on and so forth. You know, if he ends his life with a good reputation, he's going to show up before the Lord and say, I'm glad I did that. Because he's going to be the one that has something. Whereas the other guy is going to have nothing. You know, he had, he, he, he had his reward on earth. But the guy that cares about his reputation, you know, when, when, the, when they both meet the Lord, who is the maker of them all, you know, he's going to have something to show for it. That's why you should care about your reputation. Because it precedes you. It's like an ointment. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to follow you all the way to heaven. And, you, and I go over to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. The Bible talks about us making sure we maintain a good testimony of having a certain reputation as Christians. And look, if, you, if we've, if we've you know, brought a mark on a reputation, if we've got a bad reputation, you know, uh, it's not too late. We can restore ourselves to a, 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 a having a good reputation through faithfulness and over time. It says in Titus chapter 2, verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged women be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience. The aged women likewise, that they be, be in behavior as becometh holiness. You know, they should live their life as becometh holiness. They should, we should be able to look at the, the aged women, the godly women, and say, look, there's a, there's a certain way that they're going to live. They should have a reputation. They, that they be in behavior, right? As becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good thing, things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands. This is the reputation that they should have. To love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Obedient to their own husbands. Now, is that the reputation that the world wants for, for ladies today? It's completely opposite. But that's the reputation that God says they should have. And he said, and why is that? Look at the end of verse 5. That the word of God be not blasphemed. Look at for verse 6. The young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works. You know, there's a way you ought to lead, live your life in order to have a good reputation. A pattern of good works in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. That he that is of the contrary part may ha be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Meaning you have a good reputation. And we should live our lives in such a way that the people that would, you know, attack us or are on the contrary part, they would just say, well, there's just nothing I can point to about them. Their doctrine's right. They live right. They teach right. They're godly people. There's nothing they can point at. And if they do point to something and they say, oh, look, they teach their women to be keepers at home, so be it. You know, well, and they consider that a bad reputation, so be it. Because when we get to heaven, that's a good reputation to have. Amen. It goes on in verse 9. You, know, you say, well, you know, I'm not any of these things you know, so far. 
Look at verse 9. Exhort servants. You know, this would be talking about employees. To be obedient unto their own masters unto, and to please them well in all things. Not answering again. You know, not, not shooting off the mouth. Not just, you know, talking back to the boss. Look, there's nothing more infuriating to a supervisor than when they tell somebody to do something and then they just get this long reply back. Or they say, well, let me, you know, it's like when you, ask, you tell people, this is what I want done, and then they just have a reply. Say, well, I would, but, have you, you know, do this or that. You know, they, you know, well, this is why I did that. Wait, why did you do this? Why are you doing that? Stop doing that. Well, here's why I did it, and here's why we should do it, and blah, blah, blah. It's talking back, right? He's saying not answering again, meaning not when they ask you a question, you know, clamming up. The Bible says not to answer again. That's not only time, it's talking about talking back to your employer. That shouldn't happen. Not purloining, you know, laying around lazy on the job, but showing all good fidelity, faithfulness, fidelity, that they may do what? Why is it, what's the purpose of doing all that? Of, of, in all these different categories of being in good behavior, of being of sound speech, so on and so forth, all these things that we just read at the end there, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. That we would have a good reputation as Christians, as God's people. You should care about your reputation. And if you've marred it, if you've gotten a bad one, look, it can be restored through faithfulness, just like David did. He was known as a faithful man. We'll look at that more in a minute. But it didn't come easy. It took time, and there was a battle involved. You know, the, the, and you say, well, I don't know if that's possible. You know, I, I understand what you're saying about David, but, you know, when people are just, they're just gone too far, there's no coming back from that. I've just made such a mess out of things. I can't restore a good reputation. It's just too bad for me. Well, you know, and I, and I talked about this a little bit on Sunday, but the Apostle Paul, and if you would, go over to Acts chapter 9 and keep a bookmark there when you get there. The Apostle Paul is an example of one who has restored a bad reputation over time. You know, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me in the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorant and unbelief. He's like saying, I used to have this bad reputation of being a persecutor, an injurious, a blasphemer. It's not a good reputation. He had a really bad one. Acts chapter 9, and it was known. People knew who Paul was. Verse 13, of course, when, when the Lord is telling Ananias to go and see Paul and to preach to him the gospel, it says, Then Ananias answered, the Lord, I have heard by many of this man. He's saying, look, there's been a lot of talk about Paul, you know, who was before time called Saul. How much evil he hath done to the saints that are at, at Jerusalem. I mean, he's done so much evil to who? To the saints, to the church. He's injurious. He was a persecutor. And there, here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. You say, Lord, you're sending me to somebody who has a very bad reputation when it comes to Christians. And he's kind of to the point where he, you know, he's kind of pleading his case where he's, he's fearing for his own, you know, his own life. You're putting me in harm's way, Lord. Which wasn't the case, we understand. Go over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Let's look a little bit more about Paul's reputation. I'll begin reading in verse 20 of Galatians chapter 1. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. <coughs> Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face into the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But that they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past, that was his reputation, now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. And they glorified God and me. So they're saying, look, he's coming unto these churches and they're saying, this is the guy who persecuted us in times past and now preaches the faith which he did destroy us. And what did they do? They glorified God in him. What had Paul done? He had restored his reputation as somebody who was a blasphemer, persecutor, and injurious to now one who preached the very faith which he destroyed and it brought glory to God. You know, when, when a person who has a bad reputation gets right, that's a glory to God. That's a glory, because that only God you know, gives us the, the, the ability and the power to do that. You know, Paul said, he thanks Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, who hath counted me you know, he, that he counted me faithful and, and, and put me into the ministry. You know, it was God, it was Jesus Christ that enabled him to be able to restore that reputation and it brought glory to God. You say, well, I want that. Well, understand this. It takes time. You've got to be faithful over time. It's not a light switch. It's not something you just flip on. I'm faithful now. Where's my good reputation? It's something you have to earn. If you look at Galatians chapter 1 and you back up there, 
It says, but it pleased God to separate who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal a son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately, so he's talking about when he got saved, right back in Acts chapter 9. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. You know, saying as soon as I got saved and I knew I was going to preach the Gentiles, I just went around and told everybody, hey, it's okay now. I've got to, you know, I'm on your side. They were all apprehensive. They were fearful. And he says, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem, you know, where he had done great harm to the saints. You know, just, just a few days previous, a few weeks previous, and you know, very recently Paul had been there, Saul, and he was persecuting them. He said, well, I'm saved now. Let me just show back up where I was. You know, well, I'm saved now. You just got to respect me because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm one born out of due time. I'm going to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. You know, I'm going to pick up, I'm going to, I'm going to pick up your slack. You know, what he did, he said, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went up to Jerusalem, which were apostles, with, to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia. He's talking about the desert. And returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. Yeah, he restored his reputation, but you know what? It took time. He had to go out in the desert. He had to go out and spend three years as an unknown, as not, you know, this great apostle. And he had to prove himself that, you know, he's no longer doing these old things. I'm no longer a persecutor. I'm no longer injurious. And he went out and he preached. And now he's going to go preach to the Gentiles, and then I'll go back to Jerusalem after I've established my reputation after time. Yes, he was faithful, but it, he had to give it time to let that faithfulness sink in with other people, to see that it was real, that it was true, and then they could glorify God in him. We want to restore that, that, that our reputation to that of being a faithful person? Good. It's possible, even for a man like Paul. But you have to understand it takes time, and you have to remain faithful over time. You have to understand it wasn't easy. Look at, and you're still in Acts chapter 9. If you're not, that's okay. But if you want to look at verse 15 in Acts chapter 9. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, he's talking to Ananias. He's like, no, you need to go. For he, Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Man, what a great testimony, Paul. What was in store for Paul? To bear, you know, to, to, uh, bear his name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel? Exciting. To go out there and be able to just preach to these thousands and preach the gospel to these people. And the children of Israel, and you say, well, we want that. Well, better read verse 16 first. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Mm -hmm. You pay a price to bring that message abroad. And look, if you want to restore your reputation to being one of who is faithful, you have to give it time. You have to understand it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a battle. It's going to be fight. It's going to be suffering along the way. Now let's take a minute here and look. We've looked at David's reputation with King Achish. I know we didn't really go into it, but you know, if, if you look in those, go back to 1 Samuel chapter 29, you know, in verse 3, it says, then, then said the, or excuse me, verse 2. Well, let's just pick it up in verse 1. We didn't read it. Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek, and the Israelites pitched by a fountain, which is in Jezreel. And the Lord of the Philistines passed by on, uh, on, on by hundreds and by thousands. But David and his men passed on in the rearward, and with Achish. So they're hanging out with the king, right? Then said the princes of the Philistines, what do these Hebrews here? Then Achish said unto the princes of the Philistines, is not this David? There it is again. Don't you know who this is? This is David. Don't you know his reputation? Is not this the servant, uh, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel? You know, that's how he was known for. This is, this is that guy that was loyal to Saul. Even to the point where he could have killed him and taken the throne. He was still, you know, humanly speaking, that's what they thought. David understood you can't touch the Lord's anointed. He said, this is the servant of Saul. That was his reputation, a man of faithfulness. Don't you know who this is? This is why he's by me. That's why I have him right here next to me because I know he's not going to do anything to me. He's the servant of Saul. This is, is, this is David. And it says there, is not this David the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me these days or these years? And I have found no fault with him since the, he fell unto me unto this day. No fault. He's been perfect. Jump down to verse 6. Then Achish called David and said to him, Surely as the Lord liveth, thou hast been upright, and thy going out and thy coming in with me in the host is good in my sight. For I have not found evil in thee the day since of thy coming unto me unto this day. Nevertheless, the Lord's favor thee not. And of course, he goes on to tell him, You got to go home, David. And we talk about how Achish might be a little bit of a weak leader, letting these lords tell him what to do. And, Saul, and David might have been like, Well, Saul wasn't like that. I've downgraded an employer's. 
Look at verse 9. And Achish answered and said, unto, and said to David, I know that art good in my sight and as an angel of God. So this is the reputation that he has with King Achish as somebody who is very faithful. But we need to also understand that the, he, he also had a, a reputation with, uh, I'm kind of losing my place here, a reputation also with the princes. <coughs> get my spot here okay yeah there it is okay David's reputation we kind of we understand that's David's reputation that's part of it right and that he has a reputation with them but David re ha also had a reputation among the princes or the lords of the Philistines and what was his reputation well it was one that he was faithful to Saul well he's faithful to the king and they're like yeah we know that's the problem <laughs> Thing. He's the servant of Saul. Exactly. That's why he's got to go. Because, you know, how do we know he's not going to get in the battle? And then it, it, he says there, you know, that he's going to, you know, be re reconciled to his master. And how's he going to do it? With our heads. Right? And remember, it says that how many people were with David when he went over there? He had 600 men. And we just read how the, the, the Philistines passed by in hundreds and in by thousands. So David and his men, they're vastly outnumbered. But he's got such a reputation, not only as a faithful man, but as a great warrior that these Philistines are saying, I know it's only 600 of them. We got them outnumbered, but you got to send him back. Because if David decides in the midst of the heat of the battle that he'd rather be, he continue to be loyal to Saul and his army, things might not go good. So, and he wants to be reconciled to Saul. He might do so by taking our own heads off and killing us. He's saying, well, there's only 600 of them. There's thousands of us. Yeah, but he had a reputation. They knew, oh, this is David who killed Goliath as a boy. You know, this is David, and, and there's other, if we remember the story, you know, David had fought the Philistines previously before this and, and won victories. So he has a reputation of being a faithful man, but he, and you can see how they're coming to do different conclusions. They both know, yeah, he's faithful, but they're coming to different conclusions about what that means to them. So David's reputation among the Philistines and lords is that he is a great warrior. First Samuel 29, look at verse, verse 4. And the princes of the Philistines were wroth with him, the king, right? And the princes of the Philistines said to him, Make this fellow return that he may go again to his place which thou hast appointed him, you know, Ziklag, and let him not go down to battle with us, lest in the battle he be an adversary to us. For wherewith shall he reconcile himself unto his master? Should it not be with the heads of these men? Is not this David of whom they have sang so, uh, one to another in song and dances, saying, Saul slew his, uh, his thousands and David his ten thousands? Saying, yeah, he's faithful. That's the problem. You need to send him back. But I want us to understand that if we want to restore a reputation of faithfulness, or if we want to earn our, a, a reputation of being somebody who's faithful, look, like Paul, it's going to take time. It has to be done over time, but not only that, it's going to be hard to do. It's not going to come without suffering. It's not going to come without a battle. The reputation of faithfulness does not come without a fight. You know, people are going to try and ruin your reputation. The Bible says the adulteress will seek for the, for the precious life. You know, the, 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 the more reputation we have as a godly people, the more the devil is going to want to destroy us. Right. You know, there's people out there, like, for example, people who want to commit adultery. If you're married, that's who, who they want. They want that. They want to bring down that reputation. If you're a young person who has a reputation of being godly, of being pure, and, and, and you know what? That just makes you more precious and people, the, the wicked, are going to want to make you fall even more. Yeah. Look, earning a reputation as being somebody who's faithful takes time and it doesn't come without a fight. And I'm here to tell you this tonight that the Christian life is a battle. You know, when you got saved, you got put on the front lines. You know, and, and, and you can go ahead and go back and, and run away and don't be surprised. The enemy's not going to stop shooting. And you can go ahead and catch one in the back if you want. But if you want to get, you know, get, it, get a reputation of someone who's a great warrior like David who's going to accomplish something for God, then you've got to get in the front lines and stay there and be someone who's willing to take you know, and, and go with the charge, lead the charge, be in the charge. The Christian life is a battle. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I should have had to keep something over there, but 2 Timothy chapter 2. We, a lot of familiar passages, but I'm going to read them because it's important that we be reminded of the fact that reputations do not, good reputations do not come easy. It takes time. They don't come without a fight. The Christian life is a battle all the way through. Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What do you need to be strong for? 
I thought the Christian life was just going to be a cakewalk. No, you got to be strong because it's a fight. Verse 2, And the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach all others also. Thou therefore endure hardness. See, the Christian life is hard. I know. Endure it. Right. If you want that reputation, you have to endure the hardness. Amen. A lot of people fall out and they get the reputation of, well, you could endure hardness. It just got a little too hard for them. We want to be somebody who's known that has, you know, we, that we're hardened, we're, we're tough, we have some grit. We're not just going to fall out every time things get tough. Mm -hmm. Thou therefore endure hardness as what? As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Why would he use a terminolo terminology like a soldier of Jesus Christ if the Christian life isn't a fight, a warfare, a battle? You know, when they're, when they're recruiting for the army, I don't think they go look for the, you know, they don't go looking for sugar britches, you know. They don't go looking for the queer, effeminate sissy. They're like, we want you. Uncle Sam wants you. You know, the scratch, you know, just, you know, somebody who has no hardness, no, no, no toughness, no grit. No, they want, they, they put them in boot camp. What do they do? They toughen them up because they know that they're going to go out and fight a battle. And Paul's saying here, look, if we're going to have a reputation of somebody who is faithful, who's able to teach others also, you know, we have to be people who are ready to endure hardness, persecutions, fights, battles. And just the battle of living the Christian life, you know, against the flesh, the world, the flesh, the devil. We have these, you know, this unholy trinity that just wants to wage war on us every single day. That's why Paul said, I die daily. I crucify the flesh every day. He says in verse 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. You know, not someone who's just going to coast through the Christian life and just have, take it easy. No, you've got to be a soldier. That's what God has called us to. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. The Bible uses this kind of language over and over and over again about being a soldier, about fighting a warfare. Jesus said in Matthew 10, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. He didn't say I send you forth as sheep to, to you know, just go take it easy. Just go graze in that green pasture and, and, and lap cool waters from that spring. And we know that there's highs and lows in the Christian life and so on and so forth. But he's saying, look, I'm sending you out for it as sheep amongst wolves. You're going to have enemies. Be therefore wise as serpent and harmless as doves. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul writing again, you, Finally, my brethren, be strong. There's that same language he told Timothy. Be strong, therefore. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God. Who puts on armor? Soldiers. A knight, you know, you think about a knight putting on the breastplate and all these things. You think about a soldier putting on the body armor. They may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Look, we've got a real enemy. That's a, that, that's a pretty strong enemy, talking about the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's who we're doing battle with. That's why it says be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Because you, look, you and I can't fight that enemy. We, that's a losing battle. We're never going to win that in our own strength. But if we stand in the power of the Lord, if we're faithful to the Lord, if we're faithful to his word, you know, that's when we stand in his might. Amen. Wherefore, take unto the whole armor of God that may be able to withstand the evil day, having done all to stand. Go over to 1 John chapter 4. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, you're going to 1 John 4, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so spar I. So spar I. You know, I roll, you know. So swing I in the hammock. No. So fight I. So fight. That's the Christian life. A fight. Not as one that beateth the air. 1 Peter chapter 5, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. You've know, you got to fight on your hands when you're going to live the Christian life. You want that reputation of someone who's faithful, who sticks by the stuff, who goes through the battles, who comes out the other side, you know, maybe a little bit bloodier, maybe a little bit bruised, but still standing, victorious. You want that reputation of faithfulness? Then you better be ready to stand. You better be ready to fight. Understand that you are in a battle. Look at 1 John chapter 4. Verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they have God. Because many false prophets are gone out in the world. You know, people want to talk about, well, when the Antichrist comes, things are going to be really bad. Look, they're bad already. 
you know, these false, you know, the, when the, when the beast stands up and the false prophet, man, it's going to be so tough. There are already many false prophets got in the world. Hereby I know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth not Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Jump down, uh, verse 3, it says, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And now is that spirit of Christ, Antichrist. It's, it's there. Not, not, and, th excuse me, and this is the spirit of Christ, Antichrist. Where you have heard that it should come. Oh, it's going to come one day. It's going to be really bad. No, and even now it is already in the world. Look, the fight has already been brought to your doorstep, right. spiritually speaking. Yeah. And when you got saved and you decided to start living for the Lord, the fight is coming to you. It's already in the world. And if you want to have that, that, that reputation of faithfulness, even if we've messed up in the past, look, we should have hope, like, like Paul and others that we could point to, that it's possible to restore a reputation to being that of one who is faithful, who sticks by the stuff and doesn't cave. Y if you're going to do that, you have to understand it's going to take time and that it's going to take a battle. To be faithful is to be somebody who sticks in it for the long haul and is ready to engage in a fight because that's what the Christian life is. It's a, it's a fight that's been brought to us. So that's my admonition to you tonight. You know, be like, be like David tonight, somebody who has a reputation that goes before him, not as one that stinks, but one that says, not this David, you know, who, 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 of whom they sang. He has slain 10,000. You know, we would want that. that kind of, and you know what? We don't search, seek for vain glory, you know, but who wouldn't want that? Say, hey, this is so-and-so. You know, they went through this trial and they, and they, they, they accomplished great works. I mean, think about the reputation that some of these churches have. You know, Verity Baptist Church. You know, those of us that know the backstory with that church, they have a reputation of people who are faithful, who stand and fight for the Word of God, right? Even when the Sodomites come out in the hundreds and protest and are there for months and months and months and causing all kinds of trouble, people still come to church and they come out on the other side and they're still standing today. Think about, you know, of course, it's on everyone's mind, First Works Baptist Church. You know, they have a reputation today of somebody who's going to stand and continue to go forward and fight the battles of the Lord, right. even if Sodomites literally blow up their church. Right. Faithful Word has a reputation of people that are going to stand for the Word of God and preach the whole counsel of God and not back down. Yeah. But that didn't come overnight. That comes over time. True. And that doesn't come without a fight. So be ready to engage in a fight if you want that reputation of one who's faithful. Let's go ahead and pray.